I'm Sarah, and I'll be your host tonight. So welcome to Foreplay, our first of our monthly virtual play reading series. And we're really excited to have you here. Um, so we got this idea, as you all know, we cannot do any live theater. Um, so we had heard from the Deep Cove Stage Society out in North Van that they were doing these for a couple of months and they were really successful and they got a lot of people involved. And so Between Shifts Theatre decided, why not us? So here we are. So really appreciate that you're here. Um, so tonight we have three short plays for you, um, written by locals, written by well-known and some not so well-known playwrights. Um, it shouldn't go for longer than an hour. And then we ask that you please keep your um, audio and video off until the end where we can do some bows and then you're free to turn your cameras on and have a chat with the actors or directors or writers who a lot of them are here tonight. So just so you know, these have only been rehearsed once or twice. So they're raw and they're real. And I think you're really gonna like them. So let's get the show started. Our first play is called Grimalkin and it is by local playwright, Joseph T. Leander directed by Peter Slade and starring Kathy Daniels and Shannon Putnam. So take it away, guys. Come in. Oh, good morning, Mr. Wright. Did you bring the things I wanted? Well, good morning to you too, Judy. Huh. Good morning, Miss Jones. That's better. I came as soon as I got your message. Did you pick up my mail? Yes, here it is. Did you water the plants? Yes. Have you been feeding my dog and walking him like I asked? But you haven't. Never mind. Sit down. Sit down. I suppose you're wondering why I called you here. It had crossed my mind. I've never been to this nursing home before. Well, let's not beat around the bush. Let's cut to the chase. I'm dying. Uh oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Wright. Call me Armand, uh, uh, Judy. Well, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear this bad news, Armand. Well, no need to be sorry. I've lived a good long life. <laughs> how are you sure that you're, uh, how are you sure that you're dying? Brain scan came back yesterday. It's late phase inoperable cancer. Oh, I am so sorry. All right, stop saying you're sorry. I called you here because I wanted to share something with you before I die. Something that I've never shared. Okay, but I hardly know you. Have you spoken to anybody else? Don't you have any family? Nope, no family, never married, no living relatives. My work wouldn't allow that. I have uh, nobody. <laughs> oh, I I'm so sorry to hear that. There you go again. Please stop saying you're sorry. Sorry, oops, um, never mind. There I go again. Oh, okay, now that you've got my full attention, what do you want to tell me? Do you know how old I am? I've never really given it a thought. I only moved in a couple months ago, so all I know is what you've told me over the garden fence. Your age never came up. So how old are you, Armand? I'm over 175 years old. <laughs> okay, but Armand, nobody can live that long. That's just where you're wrong. You see, I've lived several lives, nine in total, just like an old gray cat. <laughs> are you sure you're well? Totally well, never felt better. Fully lucid and compass mentis, except for these damned headaches. Should I call the nurse? No, 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 I'm fine. But what you just told me, it's a little strange. Strange, but true. 
but I can appreciate your, uh, you know, your reservation. Tell me, have you ever heard of the Grimalkin? No. Should I have? What is it? Haven't you seen my picture in the papers? No. I've only been here a few months, so I'm not really up on the local news. You haven't done anything wrong, have you? Oh, no, no. On the contrary, I've done good. I suppose you wouldn't have recognized me anyways, behind the mask and the costume. What do you mean? Like theater or at Halloween? No, when I'm saving lives. What, what are you talking about, Armand? And what's a grammatchen? It's Grimalkin. Grim all Ken. It's an old gray cat with powers. Powers? What powers? The powers to do good. Supernatural powers. Okay, Mr. Wright. This must be the meds or the tumor talking. Please, please sit down and hear me out, would you? I'll start at that beginning. A very good place to start. Are you quoting from The Sound of Music? What? Oh, now you're humoring me. Never mind, never mind. You see, I first got the powers when I was in my mid twenties, towards the end of the American Civil War. The American Civil War. It was in Atlanta. The wagon I was riding in was shredded by a cannonball. I was thrown out, pinned underneath it with a splinter piercing my back. This guy staggered up. He later told me that his name was Will grabbed the wreckage one-handed and lifted it off me. He then teased that shard out of my back. That hurt quite a lot. And then collapsed next to me. He had a terrible wound himself. His innards were literally hanging out. I'd seen many wounds like that. So I didn't know how it was possible that he did what he did, but I was in so much pain. I, I didn't think any more about it. All I remember was that the two of us lay there for hours thinking we were both about to die a slow and painful death. That's horrible. As night fell, we lay there in agony. He told me an amazing story. He told me that he was the Grimalkin. He told me, I, I get this, get this, that he had died eight times before, but this, the end of his ninth life, would be the last time. He told me he'd lived through previous wars, starting with the Indian Wars in 1757, and had other adventures doing good, saving lives. With superpowers, he had saved people from fires, mine cabins, farm accidents, and, and so on. So this is just a fictional story that you've been working on, right? I thought that this was the ramblings of a confused eye mind, mind as well, but then, a weird thing happened. He told me that he'd gotten these powers from a man he'd found dying, one who'd come to the end of his nine lives and was ready to pass on the gift. Then he, Will, simply touched my arm and breathed the magic word in my ear. I felt a surge of energy and then closed my eyes thinking I was in shock and wouldn't live to see another day. But the next morning, I woke up alive. And when it got light, I saw Will next to me, stiff and stone cold dead. Miraculously, my wound had healed and I made it back to my own lines to fight another day. Before he died, Will told me that the power of the Grimalkin had been passed down for generations and that I would have the honor for the next nine lives, however long that would be, right up to this very moment. Well, that's quite an incredible story, Armand. But excuse me for saying this, I find it pretty hard to believe. There's no such thing as superheroes with superpowers. And perhaps maybe I actually should call the nurse and just head home. Okay, okay. What do you think this is? <gasps> oh God, that's a nasty scar. That's from the battle in Atlanta. And, and this one, this was from the Great War. 
and, and, and I was dead for six hours until I woke up in the morning and I ski daddled out of there before they got the shock of their lives by finding me alive under the sheet. I got this beautiful scar here when I was murdered, bur bursting climbed in Chicago in the 1930s and a horrible gash right here from the Second World War. And later in Korea- No, 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 no. I get it, I get it. Oh, oh that's incredible. But if you don't mind me asking, why do you look so old now? Like a real old man. You ha Why haven't you started to stay young? Like in your 20s, say, from the very beginning? Good question. And I don't mind you asking. Simple answer is, I don't know. It seems like the aging process slows after each resurrection, but the years eventually cap catch up to the point where you see me as I am now. But you must agree, I look remarkably good for someone who's coming up to 200 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I actually can't argue with that. So between those wars, I worked in law enforcement, freelancing, like the Cape Crusader. The press occasionally caught a glimpse of me, those photos in the paper I, I mentioned, dishing out justice to crooks, thugs, and hooligans, and saving people even cats and dogs from fires, natural disasters, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you think? I think it's, I think it's a fantastic story. And I'll have to check the new local newspapers. I've just never heard of the Grim, the Grimalkin. You don't believe me, do you? <laughs> How can I convince you? No, no, if that's your story, then I believe you. How about this? I saved your father's life recently, Raymond Jones. What? How do you know his name? And what do you even mean? He came to fix you and visit you, uh, uh, you a couple of weeks ago to fix the exhaust on your car. He got caught under it when the jack gave way. What do you know about that? That was scary. He said he had just enough room to wriggle free. He didn't mention seeing you. He didn't see me. Believe it or not, in spite of how I look now, just a few weeks ago, I could move with the agility of a cat and lift heavy objects like cars with feline strength and then quietly disappear. But maybe you just heard him across the patio and you overheard mom call his name. No, 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 it was me. Huh. Um, when he was trapped, I saw the little red devil tattoo on his butt cheek when his pants rolled down. <laughs> but how did you know about that? That's his get thee behind me Satan joke thing. Oh my God. So you, you were there? Could it really actually have been you? Believe me now? I don't know what to believe, but why did you call me here? You could have just told that story to anyone. But I chose you. My end isn't very far away, but Grimalka must live on. No, don't talk like that. Now you told me the story, Grimalka will live on, but what do you mean I chose you? I want you to be the next Grimalkan. Well, I'm flattered and honored, but I don't think that I could do that. I have a job, I work out every day, and I may even decide to have kids one day. Look, Judy, there are two important dates in your life. The day you were born and the day you figure out why. Think about that. Imagine what I'm offering you. The chance to be reborn several times and plenty of time to figure out why. Just remember what I did for your father. Wouldn't you like to help out others in the same way? Yeah, that sounds all well and good. Don't uh, you want to live a life of nine lives? But you're not dead yet. No, but don't you see? I must pass this on to somebody, you, while I'm still alive. I just have to lay hands on, oh, okay, don't worry. I'm not, I'm not a creepy old man. And whisper the word, then nature, Oh, or should I say super nature, will take its course. You'll feel the surge. And when I die, you will have the powers of the Grimalkin. 
Just like that? Just like that. I don't know. It seems like such a large responsibility. What about the costume? What? <laughs> you can take one from my closet at home if there's one you like. Or maybe you can make one yourself. But be sure to incorporate a big capital G on your, uh, your, your chest. Wear a cat mask and you're on your way. Well, I suppose there's another benefit to the costume. I could even wear it on Halloween. Um, now you're not taking me seriously. Okay, okay. I can go along with this. So what happens next? Well, we do it here and now, or we leave it for another time, but I may be dead in the morning. Then the power of Grimalkin will have died with me. Uh, oh, oh! No, what's wrong, what's wrong? Nothing, nothing, I'm just tired. I, I haven't talked this much in weeks. Okay, well, maybe you should rest and I'll call the nurse. No, no, it has to be now. Well, I- Judy, please, please come here, please. It's time. Are you quite sure? Yes, of course, I'm sure. Take my hand. Like this? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Now, now come closer. For the word? Yes, yes, it's- oh. I'm ready. It's, it's the same word whispered to me by that dying man in Georgia all those years ago. You must pass it on when you choose your successor many, many years from now. The word is, the word is. Yes, yes. It's Excelsior. What? Wait a minute. I've heard that word before, Excelsior? The guy who died a few years back. Spider-Man guy, Stan, Stan, Stan Lee, that's it, Stan Lee, that was his word. And where do you think he got it? Are you trying to tell me that he got that word from you? I met him in a bar in Manhattan back in the 50s before he got famous. We got talking and uh, after a few drinks, I, I told him the story I just told you. I think the stars convinced him as well. So why didn't he write about Catman instead of Spider-Man? Uh, my dear Miss Jones, maybe because names like Catwoman and Batman were already taken? I don't know. But come closer. I haven't much time and we haven't finished yet. Do you feel the surge? No, not yet, but I'm sure it will come. I hope you're right. <sighs> I can't do any more. I think you should get some rest. Maybe I should come back in the morning. Well, if you come back then, I may not be looking quite so perky. Now, just go out and, and do good. I'd say live long and prosper if they hadn't stolen that from me as well. Oh, I think you'll still be around after a good night's sleep. Goodbye, Judy. Or should I say, Madam Grimalkin. And good hunting! So long, Mr. Cat of Nine Lives, and thank you. And Judy, don't forget to water the petunias. <laughs> no problem. And please, please take good care of my dog. Don't forget to feed him properly and take him for walks. Oh, Armand, Armand, I'm truly sorry, but I have to tell you, you don't have a dog. You only have a cat. A cat named Lazarus. Thank you so much, guys. Well done. And next we have a play called Enigma written by Floyd Dell and directed by yours truly and starring Heather Evans and Jeremy Chu. Take it away, guys. So that's what you think? Yeah, for us to live together any longer would be an obscene joke. Let's just end it here while we have some sanity and decency left. Is that the best you can do in the way of sanity and decency to talk like that? Yeah, you'd like to cover it up with some pretty little words, wouldn't you? Well, I've had enough of that. I feel as if my face were covered with spider webs, I just want to brush them off and get clean again. It's not my fault you've got weak nerves. 
why don't you try to behave like a gentleman instead of a hysterical minor poet? A gentleman? Helen would have strangled you years ago. It, it takes a man with crazy notions of, of freedom and generosity to be the fool that I have been. Oh, I suppose you blame me for your ideas. I'm past blaming anybody, Helen, even myself. Helen, don't you realize that this has got to stop? We're, we're cutting each other to pieces with knives. You want me to go? Or I'll go, it makes no difference. Only we've got to separate definitely and forever. You, you really think there's no possibility of our, our finding some way? We might be able to, to find some way. We have found some way, Helen, twice before, and this is what it comes to. These are the limits to my capacity for self-delusion. This is the end. Yes. Only... Only what? Well, it seems well, such a pity. Pity? Pity? The pity is this, that we sit here and haggle about our hatred. That's all that's left between us. Well, I won't haggle, Paul. If you think we should part, we shall part this very night. But I don't want to part this way, Paul. I know I've hurt you. I want to be forgiven before I go. Can't we finish without another sentimental lie? I am in no mood to act on another pretty little scene. That, that was unjust, Paul. You know I don't mean that. What I want is to make you to understand so you don't hurt or you don't hate me. More explanations. You know, I thought we both got tired of those. I used to think it was possible that we could actually heal a wound with words, but you and I ought to know better, hey? They're like acid in it. Oh, please don't, Paul. This is the last time we shall ever hurt each other. Won't you listen? Go on. I know you hate me. And you have a right to. Not just because I was faithless, but be because I was cruel. I, I don't want to excuse myself, but... I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't realize I was hurting you. We've gone over this a thousand times. Yes, I've said that before. And you've answered me that that excuse might hold for the first time, but not for the second and the third. You've convicted me of deliberate cruelty on that. And I've never had anything to say. I couldn't say anything because the truth was ugh, too preposterous. Well, it wasn't any use telling it before, but now I want you to know the real reason. Oh, a new reason, hmm? Something I've never confessed to you. Yes, it is true that I was cruel to you deliberately. I, I did want to hurt you. And, and do you want to know why? I wanted to shatter that Olympian serenity of yours. You were too strong, too self-confident. You had the air of a, of a being with no that nothing could hurt. You were like a god. That was a long time ago. And was I ever Olympian? I'd forgotten. You succeeded very well. You shattered it in me. You're still Olympian, and I still hate you for it. I wish I could make you suffer now, but, but I've lost my power to do that. Are you contented with what you've done? It seems to me that I've suffered enough to even satisfy your ambitions. No, or you couldn't talk like that. You sit there making phrases. Oh, I've hurt you a little, but you'll recover. You've always recovered quickly. You're not a human. If you were human, you would remember that we were once happy and, and be a little sorry that this is all over, but you can't be happy or you can't be sorry. You, you've made up your mind and, and can think of nothing but that. Yeah, that is an interesting and novel explanation. I wonder if I can make you understand. Paul, do, do you remember when we fell in love? Something like that must have happened to us, yeah. No, no, it happened to me, it didn't happen to you. You made up your mind and walked in with the air of a god on a holiday. It was I who fell, headlong, dizzy, blind. I didn't want to love you. It was a force too strong for me. It, it swept me into your arms and I prayed against it. I, I had to give myself to you, even though I, I knew you hardly cared. I had to, for my heart was no longer in my own breast. It was, it was in your hands and you could do what you liked with it. You could have thrown it in the dust. This is all very romantic and exciting, but tell me, did I throw it in the dust? Well, it pleased you not to. You put it in your pocket, but don't you realize what it is to feel that another person has absolute power over you? No, for you could never feel that way. And you have never been utterly dependent on another person for happiness. I was utterly dependent on you. It humiliated me, angered me. I rebelled against it, but it was no use. You see, my dear, I was in love with you. And you were free and your heart was your own and nobody could hurt you. Yeah, very fine, only that wasn't true as you soon found out. 
when I found out I could, I could hardly believe it. Well, it wasn't possible. Why you had said a thousand times that you would not be jealous if I were to be in love with someone else too. Well, it was you that put the idea in my head. It seemed part of a superhumanness. I did talk that way, but I wasn't superhuman. I was just a damn fool. And Paul, when I first realized that I might be hurting you, that you were human after all, I stopped. You know I stopped. Yeah, that time. Well, can't you understand? I stopped because I thought you were a person like myself, suffering like myself. Well, it wasn't easy to stop. It tore me to pieces. But I suffered rather than let you suffer. But when I saw you recover your serenity in a day, while the love that I had struck down in my heart for your sake cried out in a death agony from us, I felt again that you were superior in human and I hated you for it. Did I deceive you so well as that? And when the next time came, I wanted to see if that was real, that godlike serenity of yours. I wanted to tear off the mask. I wanted to see you suffer as I'd suffered. And, and that's why I was cruel to you the second time. Okay, and the third time, what about that? <laughs> I can't talk about that. I can't. It's too near. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I don't wish to show an unseemly curiosity about your private affairs. If you were human, you would know there's a difference between one's last love and the one that have gone before. I can talk about the others, but this, this one still hurts. I see. So... Should we chance to meet again next year? You can tell me about it then when the pains of the old love have been healed by the joys of the new. There will be no more joy or pain of love for me. Oh, you do not believe that. But that part of me which loves is dead. Do you think I have come through all this unhurt? No. I cannot hope anymore. I cannot believe. There's nothing left for me. All I have is regret for the happiness that you and I have spoiled between us. Oh, Paul, why did you ever teach me your Olympian philosophy? Why did you make me think we were gods and could do whatever we chose? If we had realized we were only weak human beings, we, we might have saved our happiness. We tried to reckon with facts. I can't blame myself for that, this fact of human nature that people have love affairs within love affairs. I mean, I wasn't faithful to you. <laughs> But you had the decency to be dishonest about it. You did not tell me the truth in spite of all your theories. I might have never found out. You knew better than to shake my belief in our love, but I trusted your philosophy and I flaunted my lovers before you. I never realized. Be careful. My, my dear, you are contradicting yourself. Oh, I know I am. I don't care. I never, no longer know what the truth is. Oh. I only know that I am filled with remorse for what has happened. Why did it happen? Why did we let it happen? Why didn't you stop me? I want it back. Yes, our old happiness. Don't you remember, Paul, how beautiful everything was? <laughs> Give it back to me, Paul. <laughs> Do you really believe, Helen? Well, I know we can be happy again. It was all ours, and we must have it once more, just as it was. <gasps> Paul, Paul. Let me think. Oh, you're thinking. I know. Think then. Think of all the times I've been cruel to you. Think of my wantonness, my, my wickedness, not of my poor tormented attempts at happiness. My lovers, yes, think hard and, and save yourself from any more discomfort. But no, you're in no danger. What do you mean? <laughs> believed what I've been saying all this while, have you? Almost. <laughs> then don't. I've been lying. Again. Again. Yes. Well, I suspected it. Oh, wise man. You, you don't love me then. Why should I? Do you want me to? I make no demands upon you and you know that. You can get along without me. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Good. And I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, that would be interesting. I was afraid you did want me. And I was sorry for you, Paul. I thought if you did, I would try to make things up to you by starting over again, if you wanted to. So that was it. Yes, that was it. And so... You needn't say anymore, will you go or will I? 
I'm going, Paul. But I think since we may not meet this time next year that I'd better tell you the secret of that third time. When you asked me a while ago, I cried and I couldn't talk about it, but, but I can now. You mean? Yes, my last cruelty. I had a special reason for being cruel to you. Shall I tell you? Just as you please. My reason was this. I had learned what it is to love, and I knew that I had never loved you. Never. I wanted to hurt you so much that you would leave me. I wanted to hurt you in such a way as to keep you from ever coming near me again. I was afraid that if you did forgive me and take me in your arms that you'd feel me shudder and, and see the terror and loathing in my eyes. I wanted for even then, I cared for you a little to spare you that. Are you going? Did you notice the date? It's the 8th of June. <laughs> Do you remember what that means? We used to celebrate it once a year. It was, it was the day of our first kiss. Good job, guys. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And for our final performance tonight, we have A Matter of Husbands, written by Ferenc Malma, directed by our very own Janice Carroll, and starring Angela Shaw and Cheryl Hebb. Cheryl Hebb. Enjoy. You wish to see me? Yes. What can I do for you? Give me back my husband. Give you back your husband? Yes. You're wondering which one he is. He's a blonde man, not very tall, wears spectacles. He's a lawyer. Your manager's lawyer? Alfred is his first name. I have met him, yes. <laughs> no, you have. I implore you, give him back to me. You mustn't mistake my silence for embarrassment. <laughs> I am at a loss. I just don't quite see how I can give you back your husband when I haven't got him to give. <laughs> You just admitted that you knew him. Oh, well, that scarcely implies that I have taken him from you. Of course I know him. He drew up my last contract. And it seems to me that I have seen him once or twice since then backstage. A nice-spoken, fair-haired man. Did you say he wore spectacles? Yes. I don't remember him in spectacles. He probably took them off. He wanted to look his best to you. He is in love with you. He, he never takes them off when I'm around. He doesn't care what he looks like when I'm around. He doesn't love me. I implore you, give him back to me. If you weren't such a foolish young woman, I shall be very angry with you. Wherever did you get the idea that I had taken your husband from you? He sends you flowers all the time. That is a lie. Do you mean to say that I'm lying? I mean to say that someone is lying to you. I... 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 I and what about this letter? Letter? Let me see it. 
no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. <laughs> My darling, shan't be able to call for you at the theater tonight. Urgent business. A thousand apologies. Ten thousand kisses. Alfred. Oh. I found it on his desk this morning. He, he probably intended to send it to the theater by messenger. But he forgot it, and I opened it. Well, you mustn't cry. Why mustn't I? You steal my husband and I mustn't cry? Oh, I know how little it means to you. And how easy it is for you. One night you, you dress like a royal princess. And the next night you undress like a, a Greek goddess. You, you blacken your eyebrows and redden your lips and wax your lashes and paint your face. You, you have cosmetics and, and bright lights to make you seem beautiful and, and author's lines to make you seem witty and wise. No wonder a poor simple-minded lawyer falls in love with you. What chance have I got against you in my in my in my, my cheap little frock? My my own lips and eyebrows, my my own unstudied ways. I don't know how to strut and pose and lure a man. I haven't got Mr. Shakespeare's to to write beautiful speeches for me. In reality, you may be more stupid than I am, but I admit, when it comes to alluring a man, I'm, I'm no match for you. This is a very interesting case. What is? Yours. Mine? What, what, what do you mean? I mean, I have never received a flower or a letter or anything from your husband. Tell me, haven't you and your husband been getting along rather badly of late? Y yes, of, of course. You used to be quite affectionate to each other. Why, yes. And of late, you have become quite cold. Yes. Of course, it's a typical case. My dear, if you knew how often we actresses met with this sort of thing, it is perfectly clear that your husband is playing a little comedy on with you to, to make you jealous, to revive your interest in him. Do you really think that, that do, you, do you mean to say such a thing has happened to you before? times. It happens to any actress who is moderately pretty and successful. It is the oldest expedient in the world and we actresses are such a target for it. There is scarcely a man involved in the theater that hasn't used us in that way sometime or other. <laughs> Authors, uh, composers, scene developers, lawyers, orchestra leaders, uh, even the managers themselves. To regain a wife or sweetheart's interest, all they need to do is invent a love affair with us. <laughs> the wife is so ready to believe, we usually don't know anything about it. <laughs> but if we are to take notice, we don't mind. We have consolation in knowing that we have the means of making many a marriage happy that would otherwise have ended in divorce court. <laughs> but how? How how could I know? Oh, there, dear. You mustn't apologize. You couldn't have known, of course. It seems so plausible. You fancy your husband in an atmosphere of perpetual temptation in a backstage world full of beautiful sirens without scruples and morals. One actress, you suppose, is more dangerous than a hundred ordinary women. You hate us and fear us. None understands that better than your husband, who is evidently a very cunning lawyer. And so he plays on that fear and jealousy to regain the love that you deny him. He writes a letter and leaves it behind on his desk. Trust a lawyer never to do that unintentionally. <laughs> 
he orders flowers for me in the morning and probably cancels the order by the time he reaches the office. <laughs> by the way, hasn't he a lock of my hair? Yes, uh, in his desk drawer, I, I brought it with me. Yes, <laughs> they bribe my hairdresser to steal it from me. It's a wonder I have any left on my head. <laughs> is, is that how he got it? Well, I can't imagine how else. Uh, uh, tell me, hasn't he left any of my love letters lying around? No. Oh, uh, don't be alarmed, I haven't written any. Well, then what made you? Well, I, I might have. If uh, he'd come to me frankly and said, I say, Sarah, would you do something for me? My wife and, is not, and I are not getting along so well. Would you write me a passionate love letter that I can leave lying around at home where he may find it? <laughs> I certainly would have done it for him. I'd have written a letter that would have made you cry into your pillow for a fortnight. <laughs> I've written 10 like that for a very eminent playwright once, but uh, he had no luck with it. His wife was so pl proper that she returned them to him all unread. How clever you are. How good. Oh, I am neither better nor worse than any other girl in the theater, even though you do consider us such monsters. I have been a perfect fool. Well, you do look a bit silly standing there with tears in your eyes and your face flushed with the knowledge that, and the happiness because a nice little man, little blonde man with spectacles loves you after all. <laughs> My dear, no man deserves to be as adored as that, but that's your affair, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I want to give you a parting bit of advice. Don't get fooled like this again. Don't let him fool you like this again. He, he won't. Never fear. No, no matter what you may find in his pockets. Letters, handkerchiefs, my photograph. No matter what flowers he sends or letters he writes or appointments he makes. Don't be taken in a second time. You may be sure of that. <laughs> You won't say anything to him of my coming here, will you? Oh, not a word. I'm quite angry with him for not having come to me, frankly, to permission to use my name in that way. You're dear, and I, I, I don't know how to thank you. <laughs> no, you mustn't begin to cry all over again. Oh, you've made me so happy. <laughs> It's all right, Alfred. You can come in now. She's gone. Good job, guys. I would love to invite all of the actors and the writers and the directors to turn their cameras on and even the audience. We would love to see your beautiful faces if you're willing for one last final bow. Thank you everyone for coming. Stop. <laughs> Good job, guys. <laughs>